So in this module, we're going to talk about filters. And first, we need to make a terminological distinction. When we talk about filters in an audio setting, we're really talking about the most common and basic tools for manipulating the spectrum of an audio signal. So there's a close relationship between the word filter and the concept of the spectrum. In other words, that space of all possible audible frequencies. And filters are tools that let us increase or decrease the level at which certain ranges of frequencies are present. So this is really a very specific type of tool. It's a very specific definition. And so we'll need to keep straight that this definition is really a much more specific one than the more general meaning of filter that you sometimes encounter in media production software digital photography, etc. For example, in um, software like Photoshop or GIMP, it's common for a filter to mean really anything that changes the image into something different. But with audio, a filter really refers to something that lets us increase or decrease the level at which a particular range of frequencies is present in our signal. So there's a quite a large um, number of different types of filter. Um, but there are some common types that we are most likely to use, and six of those common types are here on this slide. So over here on the top left, we have a graph of um, the typical response of a high-pass filter. So frequency on this graph goes from low over here in the left corner to high over here on the right. And what the graph is showing us is how much frequencies are boosted or reduced at those frequencies. And what it's showing us basically is that we, the high frequency, the very high frequencies are present there basically as is. And then as we come down past a certain point, oops, as we come down past a certain point, the frequencies are removed more and more aggressively. So this is the high pass filter. It's a filter that above a certain frequency, the frequencies just pass through and below a certain frequency, the frequencies are reduced um, quite dramatically. The opposite of the high-pass filter would be the low-pass filter. Here's a graph of a low-pass filter. So below a certain frequency, the frequencies just pass through, um, essentially unmodified. But above that frequency, they're reduced more and more aggressively. So high-pass and low-pass filters um, are similar but not the same as high shelf and low shelf filters. So over here we have a low shelf filter. And what we see is that well above a certain frequency, um, the frequencies are present as is, and that the, then there's a kind of reduction, or it could be an increase as well, there's a change as we go past a certain frequency. And then once we're a certain distance past that, things level off and they stay the same for the remainder of the, the journey to the edge of the graph here. So that's a low shelf filter. And the opposite of the low shelf filter is the high shelf filter, where things start out, the low frequencies are present as is, and then past a certain point, they start being reduced somewhat, but then a certain point past that, the reduction ta tapers off and things are not being reduced anymore. So you can think of the um, high shelf and the low shelf filter in some ways, as um, less exaggerated versions of the high pass and the band pass filters, it's important to notice that the terminology is backwards, that the here over here is the high pass filter and its shape, see it reduces a lot of low frequencies. The high pass filter is most closely related to the low shelf filter. And the low pass filter here is most closely related or most similar to the high shelf filter here. So two more common types of filters to mention, um, the band filter and the notch filter. And one is really a variation on the other. So the band filter is a filter that reduces or, or, or could emphasize also the frequencies around a particular frequency in the spectrum. Um, and the notch filter is really just a much more exaggerated version of the same idea. So you can see here that in this notch filter, the low frequencies are present um, basically at the same level they were going into the filter, and the high frequencies are present at basically the same level they were going into the filter, but around this frequency, things are really radically reduced or eliminated. 
We could also boost those frequencies if, if we wanted with a different configuration of the filter. So speaking of the configuration of the filter, that's a good segue into our next topic, which is the typical parameters of, of filters. So we have here a screenshot from the Reaper Digital Audio Workstation, and we have a single band filter um, shown here in that interface. And we see that the filter has um, basically three controls here. It has a frequency control, which is measured in hertz, a gain control, which is measured in decibels, and a bandwidth control, which in this case is um, measured in octaves. So the frequency control is basically allowing us to specify at what point this shape is centered in the spectrum. We can maybe emphasize or de-emphasize lower or middle or high frequencies. We can move that um, control around in a very fine-tuned way to make very particular adjustments to the sound. The gain control is controlling um, how high or low this shape bends away from the middle. Um, so we have um, some negative gain right now. You can see it says minus 3.2 decibels here, which is why that shape is bending down here. We could also increase the gain to a positive number and then the shape would bend up in this part of the spectrum instead. And the third really common parameter of a filter that we're seeing here is, is called bandwidth in the Reaper interface. And when it's called bandwidth, as it gets bigger, basically the shape smooths out um, and occupies more space in the spectrum. And as bandwidth gets smaller, the, the shape gets more narrow uh, and it comes into being a little bit more like a notch filter. Um, basically, this is the bandwidth is a measurement of how specific the filter is. More bandwidth equals less specific. Less bandwidth equals more specific, right? And I think the key to remembering that is in the word um, width there, right? Um, bandwidth, it's a measure of how wide this shape around the central frequency that you're um, setting for the filter is. Now you will also encounter another way of talking about this same parameter. You'll sometimes hear it called Q instead. Q is short for quality, and um, the history of this is that when these um, filters were first invented, their initial application was really for telecommunications engineers who were wanting to restore signals to intelligibility that had traveled over really long and really not very good um, early telecommunications table, um, cables. And so in those settings, if you could make a filter that was really specific, um, that was called a high quality filter or high Q. And if your filter wasn't really specific and wasn't, didn't let you kind of do surgical things or very extreme things to the spectrum, it was a lower quality filter. And so I think the thing to take away from this is that Q works the opposite way of bandwidth. If you make higher Q, higher quality in that kind of unusual sense of the word quality, um, what you're doing is making a more specific filter. Like higher Q is a shape that will be narrower on the graph here, and lower Q will be a shape perhaps more like the one that we see here, where it's kind of um, a sort of smooth, gradual curve across the spectrum. Anyway, those are our three um, common filter parameters, the ones we're most likely going to work with, with all of the different filters that we work with. So typically, we use lots of filters together. We use banks of filters. So here's another screenshot from the Reaper Digital Audio Workstation. And in this one, each of these numbered handles represents a different filter and a different type of filter that's being combined to change the spectrum of the audio signal. Um, we can see here, for example, in this uh, screenshot that some of the very lowest frequencies are being um, removed and then sort of in the range from just under 200 hertz to about one kilohertz, we have a kind of gentle rise and fall. And then from one kilohertz really to the rest of the spectrum, we have a kind of gentle reduction of how much energy there is. So this um, is really common and um, often the plugins that let us combine filters in this way are called equalization or EQ. And the history of that also goes back to um, early experiments with telecommunications where when signals were transferred over long distances, they tended to lose energy in different parts of the spectrum. And um, engineers figured out that you could 
use filter combine filters to sort of boost the energy in different parts of the spectrum and appear to get back what was lost to some or other extent. So it was like you were making the received signal equal to the one that was, was sent, and so they called it equalization. Uh, and there are various other more contemporary contexts where that meaning makes sense too. But we'll also see there's lots of uh, settings where thinking of what we're doing with these filters as equalization doesn't really make a lot of sense, but everyone still calls it EQ or equalization anyway. I think what we really need to remember is that when people are talking about equalization or EQ, they're really talking about plugins or other devices that let you change the shape of the spectrum in systematic ways by combining filters. So um, some pro tips for using filters, some very general tips here. So tip number one, usually you filter downwards preferentially. So the history of this is that um, once upon a time, making sure that the different parts inside the studio or inside an audio system didn't clip by having levels go too high was um, even more important than it is nowadays. And so people got into the practice of um, mixing downwards and filtering downwards. And I still think it's a really good practice um, today um, and basically for the same reason, that we have projects and that we put things into those projects. And as we put more things in, they tend to add up to more and more we might have a point where we are, we might reach a point where we are clipping during mixing and having to turn down. We'll be less likely to have that moment if we've been kind of taking things away, moving things down rather than moving other things upwards as we go. It's really common to use multiple gentler filters instead of one more extreme filter. So um, an equalization plugin like that Reaper one we looked at a second ago lets us have lots of filters and combine them in an interface. And often, maybe we will get a better result by using multiple gentler filters, filters instead of one very extreme one. And finally, and I think most importantly, um, our sounds tend to be distributed through the spectrum. We saw in another module that um, real-world sounds tend to be the combination of lots of different frequencies. They're not only in one place in the spectrum. So when we... Um, use a filter to attempt to reduce or remove some part of the spectrum that um, maybe we don't want to hear, we'll probably also be removing other things that we do want to hear, and vice versa. So when we work with filters, it's really important to pay attention to the effects of filtering on all of the sounds in the sound scene that we're working with. Very quickly, some common uses of filters, by no means an exhaustive list. Um, sometimes we'll have low frequency rumble from traffic or air conditioning in our recordings and filters give uh, a straightforward way of reducing the presence of that noise in the signal. Also sometimes we'll have recordings that are excessively bright, in other words which have lots of high frequencies, um, particularly when they come from condenser microphones, which we'll talk about in another module. Um, we will often use filters to emphasize or de-emphasize particular characteristics or characteristic frequencies of particular sound sources. That's probably the most general use of a filter in audio work. And finally, we may be able to find unusual and new sounds, uh, um, especially but not only when we use extreme filter settings. So a summary of what we've talked about in this module. We sh um, saw that filters let us manipulate the spectrum emphasizing or de-emphasizing ranges or parts of it. We saw that there are several different common types or shapes of filters that we need to be familiar with. We saw that frequency gain and bandwidth or Q are the most common parameters of individual filters. We talked about how we often use banks of multiple filters combined and that this is often called equalization or EQ. And we went through some common uses and pro tips with filters.